Steven Crowder has the most popular independent news channel on YouTube. But recently, YouTube and Twitter censored him. I hate it when they do that. So I interviewed Crowder. We agree on some things, but we also debate. Here's our full interview. People know that I've had uh, battles with, with big tech for a long time, but uh, I was uh, demonetized indefinitely, both of my channels, and, uh, and, and banned from posting, uploading, streaming to YouTube for one week, uh, at least, um, assuming that they don't do what Twitter has done. At this very same time, Twitter has suspended me repeatedly without listing any reason as to why. Um, and this is what's interesting. So right now I can't talk about this on Twitter uh, and on Facebook, we've, we've been throttled. And I don't mean a conspiracy where some people out there, you know, they love to stir drama. And I think I've been shadow banned. No, Facebook told us we're going to remove your reach. Twitter has suspended me and locked me out. Here's what's interesting about Twitter. Let me back it up a little bit. With Twitter, they suspended me and it says reason listed blank. Now keep in mind, they sat before Congress and said, we are transparent and we let people know when they violate policies and we give them the opportunity to rectify it four times suspended reason blank from the previous suspension to the current suspension. Okay. I tweeted one tweet and that tweet was Twitter has told Congress that they only suspend with reason and list it to the violator and an image of the screenshot where it was blank. I was then suspended after that singular tweet after that hit from YouTube. Uh, and I can get into why YouTube has said that I am uh, suspended for the time being. Yeah. Go, Go to it. So with YouTube, they removed two. One episode was an episode where we did fifth, we did a, a one year anniversary to celebrate 15 days to flatten the curve. Okay. Now, let me be really clear. I don't think that people should be banned, even if they have crazy conspiracy theories and they're anti vaxxers, but I'm not. This is what I said in the video. And all of our sources are always available publicly at lighterwithcrowder.com. We always use original sources, neutral sources, or liberal sources as references every day. We list them publicly. We have a link in the description on YouTube every single episode, despite being a comedy show. Okay. I said that COVID is a real virus and it is significantly more lethal to old people. Never said it's not a real virus. Never said that people shouldn't take the vaccine. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to get my mother to take the vaccine because she's older. Um, I've never, never said really anything about it. Take, take your conspiracy. Never said it. Here's what I did say. And this was using the CDC and the World Health Organization in this episode, a one hour and a half, uh, one and a half hour episode. I said, look, now we have all of the data uh, uh, that's been collected from the CDC and World Health, World Health Organization. So it's a no novel virus, but we know a bit. And we know the goalposts have moved. We know that COVID-19 is significantly more lethal to the elderly and immunocompromised than the standard flu. And we know according to the CDC, their own mortality rates, that it's significantly less lethal to children and teenagers. I said, and that's it. We don't know why, but that's interesting because maybe we should study that and maybe we should treat these categories differently. Um, I even actually hosted a protest in Michigan uh, to protest the nursing home policies. I have a 97 year old grandmother in Michigan. And what I said, what I ended with was this, look, the Imperial College uh, of London study said 2.4 million would be dead, I believe. When we started this pandemic, they said a mortal, a death rate of 3%. I heard as high as seven, but mainstream acceptance was 3%. There were doctors, remember those doctors from California who were banned from Facebook and YouTube, who unlike Dr. Fauci, who hasn't seen a patient in 40 years, they were actually treating patients. And they said, based on what we've seen in our practice, uh, the mortality rate is nowhere near 3%. It's actually much closer to the common flu in that we believe the mortality rate to be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3%. They were banned. Well, they were right. And certainly, here's the thing, certainly the people who said it was more comparable to the common flu than the people who said a mortality rate of 3%, they were closer to being right. But like I said, my, my sin was significantly more deadly to old people, significantly less to young people. YouTube said you can't do that because it might cause people to not take the virus seriously. So they gave you an answer. Yeah, they just said, well, they said it goes against the World Health Organization guidelines is what they said, even though we use them as a source. There's been almost no pushback about that. People just ex accept that these things are banned. Those doctors must have been bad. They, they weren't epidemiologists, so we're being protected from bad information. Right. Yeah. And here's the thing. I didn't just say, well, let's talk about these doctors. What I said is these doctors were banned back then. And now here are the revised rates from the CDC and World Health Organization. It's far closer to what they said, which warranted a ban 
then the 3% death rate, then the Imperial College uh, of London study, which was the whole premise for 15 days to flatten the curve, which then turned into months, which then turned into a year. So that's really all that I said. So for on the COVID front, that's my sin. And that also means, look, if I'm, if I'm a comedian and I'm hosting uh, a show where I list the World Health Organization and the CDC as sources, um, and then make an inference that is irrefutably correct, the statement that I made, doctors with dissenting opinions, they haven't got a shot. And then people say, trust the science. Well, hold on a second. You don't allow the scientific process to take place. All right, let, let's leave COVID a moment. So you got demonetized. What's that mean? Yeah. Means I can make zero dollars on YouTube, despite the fact that we have an immense viewership and profit YouTube uh, immensely. They're protecting their reputation. That's what they say. Now, here's the thing. Um, and I should also be clear, I want to go back. I will go back to not just COVID, but the other episode they had a problem with was a, regarding the election. And I think that's something that'll interest you because there's a great degree of specificity there that YouTube just won't address. Yeah, I've been demonetized before. And here's the thing. I've said that, look, if YouTube wants to demonetize me, uh, meaning they want me to not be able to make a dime, okay, fine. I am not entitled to make advertising revenue. However, when they demonetize me for verifiable facts and Lil Nas X is being sodomized by Satan, and not only is that monetized, but it's deemed child friendly, that's where I have a problem. Just back up because I'm old and that went by me. What yeah. got accepted? What that is not even demonetized? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've actually showed on my, so there's, there's a current video and by, I want to be clear. I am not offended at all, right? I'm an Alice Cooper fan. I get shock rock. This is a rapper called Lil Nas X, and he, uh, to cross promote some shoes with vials of human blood in them, he did a music video where he sings about having sex with the devil and he's being sodomized by Satan in hell. That is child friendly on YouTube. Furthermore, I don't know what I'm allowed to say here or not, but I'm describing videos that on YouTube, children can search. So what I'm about to say might be shocking. Do I have your permission? Yeah, yeah you can say whatever you want. Well, I don't know, you're a decent man. So we were on our show, and um, we were, of course, told that what we our election coverage was inappropriate for children. There's a gay porn channel on YouTube where they play on camera, dick or dildo, where a man lies down, and there's a sheet, granted, and his partner inserts his penis into him, and he has to guess whether it's his penis or a dildo, and that's child-friendly on YouTube. So my issue is with it not being applied equally. Now, here's the thing. I've spent millions of dollars on YouTube in advertising where I can... Hopefully, I would like to be able to pick videos on which I would advertise, but I don't have the option of picking content like mine. They lock us out. You have the option of saying, I want to advertise on dick or dildo, but you don't have the option of saying, I want to advertise on, let's say, pro Second Amendment content or on Steven Crowder content. So I just get told from YouTube, advertisers don't want anything to do with your show, which I know isn't true because we have direct sponsors who want to, and they've been stonewalled from YouTube. And then when I'm advertising on YouTube and I say, hey, I'd really like to be able to target people who are interested in my kind of content. Well, that's not allowed. So they're the ones who determine what is advertiser friendly. It is them and them alone. It's not sponsors. And why? What's their motivation? Well, I think there's an ideological motivation beyond a profit motivation at this point. Um, and that's what's so, uh, I guess you would say pernicious might be even the appropriate word. Look, when they are saying, hey, someone cannot say that COVID-19 is more lethal to seniors and not lethal uh, significantly to seven-year-olds, we're going to remove that and demonetize it. But we are not only going to allow and make it child-friendly and run ad revenue, but we are going to put the Satan sodomizing a uh, gay black rapper uh, into the feed of kids watching Disney videos. I don't have the answer, but that's what they're doing. Political bias? Oh yeah, of course that, they would claim no. That's the issue is they always say, no, 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 no. We don't have political bias. Well, of course they've been acting as publishers. They're not a neutral platform. And, and you and I too, I'm sure that you've struggled with this in some capacity, uh, being more of a libertarian. And, and you know, I'm, I'm very much a Christian, uh, so I'd be considered conservative, but I line up really pretty libertarian is how people would describe me. I just don't, I just don't really use the term. And I mean, this is an offense because you're a libertarian, you're a true libertarian, but then Bill Maher uh, also claims to be a libertarian. So I'm like, well, what does it ha. mean anymore? So I, I, just, I know, I know. 
So I just say conservative, but I'm pretty consistently libertarian and pro-free market. I think the drug war is a failure. I find it ironic that many liberals who want to end the drug war also want to make guns illegal, like the cartels can't stand to make a profit off of that. But um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, we are at a point where it's not the free market at work. You're talking about five companies who are more powerful than any government that have existed before them who lobby the government and get political and legal protections under the guise of 230 and safe harbor laws so that they are not held accountable for what's on their platform, just like a public utility like AT&T or like Verizon. But AT&T and Verizon can't kick you off if you say something that they don't like on their phone service. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook can. They get the same protections. So um, I don't think this is about the free economy anymore, especially when you look at the many, 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 many hundreds of millions, really billions at this point that these companies uh, donate to Democratic politicians to give them favorable laws. I think they just employ a lot of young people who lean left and do it on their own. I think that would be one thing if it didn't come from the top down. If it didn't come from the top down and executives and chiefs of content and and uh, if I hadn't had experiences um, with people actually trying to guide the form of our content, um, sometimes before it airs. Let's talk about one clip of yours I, I did watch, which was good reporting. This uh, phony addresses in Nevada. Accumulated voter data uh, from government websites. Okay, we checked if the addresses were deliverable. Here's a quick snapshot collage. So you can just see, boom, 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 boom. So this is something too. So let me be really clear here because this was considered a violation of their election policy, their scams policy. Now their policy is you cannot, you can talk about voter fraud. You can talk about it happening even on a large level. You cannot say that voter fraud affected the outcome of the 2020 election or that Donald Trump won the election. Okay, fine. Got it. I didn't say that. I'm sure a lot of people have opinions. By the way, by that same standard, you can't criticize the election of Russia or Venezuela by YouTube standards. But what do you mean by saying fine? It's not fine. We ought to no, be able no, it's to not fine. talk about that. <laughs> yeah. I think someone should be able to say, uh, if they're especially if they're regulated as a public utility, that lizard people stole the election. I think people should be able to say whatever they want. Now, I will say this. I've also gone off on rants on my show about people who've alleged fraud that they, for example, Dominion, where I say, look, look, we have evidence of this kind of fraud taking place that we can verify. But if we have evidence of something that is significant enough, and then someone else comes out and says, 60 million votes were stolen, you go, well, now the truth can't get past the lie. And I don't think they necessarily need to be banned. But what I say is, people who try and peddle these election fraud theories that are unfounded make our lives very difficult. So I spoke with my lawyer. This is the other episode that was removed for violating the policies. My half Asian lawyer, Bill Richmond, I said, look, what can I say? What can I do? He said, well, you can't say anything that you haven't verified. I said, okay, can we talk about these voter rolls with people? He said, well, you can't, unless you visited those gravestones, you can't say that. I said, okay, look, would I be in the legal clear if I went on air and said, okay, I cannot discuss any other instances of fraud aside from these several dozen addresses that I've personally verified here on video with a copy of today's newspaper? He said, you can do that. I said, good. So what we did was we looked at the voter rolls. Okay, we had my researchers do it, some, some brilliant people, and I, of course, worked tirelessly with them. We went through the voter rolls, cross-referenced it with uh, uh, postal service deliverable addresses, then searched on Google Earth to see if this was a valid address or not. That should be enough, but it's not. I either went out or sent out producers to in-person verify those addresses. We have a list of, of I want to say, thousands but we don't have enough time to visit all of them. So we visited, I think, somewhere between 25 and 30 something, mainly in Nevada and Michigan, because those were the easiest states for us to get access to these and also comply with the voter laws. Now, we went on air and said, look, I can't say anything else, but I, I can definitely tell you that this is not a legitimate voting address. I, can say, I said, I can definitely tell you that this, you know, an empty lot with today's paper on video, an overpass with a copy of today's paper and their voting log. Um, I said, I can tell you that these are not valid votes and nobody cares. Now here's where it gets interesting. We got fact checked by someone anonymous on Reddit, something like that. And they said that we got, uh, I think three things wrong. And this is what spurred me to go do more research and we caught something far more sinister. Uh, they were right, they were right to their credit, we were wrong. One of the addresses in Nevada was an empty lot. Turns out my intern took a video of the empty lot next to the empty lot where the vote came from. 
Odds and evens are hard in Vegas to keep track of. And when you're surrounded by empty lots like Tatooine, it's hard to know which one is the empty lot. So we did make that mistake, but the vote was still from an empty lot across the street. But this made me paranoid. And I said, okay, that in the end, that's still a, a happy mistake really, because it showed us that there's even more, uh, pr there are even more problems with the voter rolls, but I need to go back and make sure that I'm right. And there have been no other mistakes. And I thought that I got one wrong. And the one that I thought I got wrong was this lady named uh, Christina Gupana, who worked for the Clintons in 2016. Uh, she was fired in disgrace over something to do with, I think, voter fraud, actually. Uh, and no one has really seen her since 2018. Not quite a missing person, but a lot of people are looking for. Her. So when I went through my voting rolls, I realized this is Christina Gupana in Vegas who voted. And I said, I can't believe we made this mistake. I showed her vote coming from under an overpass. Uh, I believe the address was somewhere on West Bonneville Avenue. And when I looked at the voter rolls, I said, it's East Bonneville Avenue. I said, oh my God, I'm gonna have to go out and apologize. I said, this isn't like me to make this careless mistake. I can't believe that this happened. Spoke with my researcher who's English and she said, no, actually we didn't make a mistake. I have the voter rolls from August. I have the voter rolls from November. They do say West Bonneville. Looks like in Nevada at the county registrar, they changed the address to East Bonneville last night. So they changed it on a Wednesday night from West Bonneville Avenue to East Bonneville Avenue after we had broadcast the show. This matters for two reasons. If you go to the Nevada uh, County, um, the county website there, sorry, the Nevada state website and the county website, they claim that they don't change any voter rolls on any day outside of Monday. This happened on a Wednesday night. Now, I said, okay, they changed it. Let me follow up. Turns out she's never lived or been to East Bonneville either. So it was updated to a new address, which was also, since we're on YouTube, a bullshit. And when I called the official spokesperson in Nevada, um, they said, well, we'll have to look into it. There's, I said, look, assuming that everything that I'm saying is not lying, assuming that I've actually spoken with the person who owns that apartment, assuming that I've been to both of these addresses and I have it on video with a copy of today's newspaper, assuming that it's true, what do you do to ensure the legitimacy and the integrity of those who are voting legitimately? And this person on air on this episode that was removed said, um, I don't believe there's any system in place to change that. So that's the issue. Even if there's verifiable, 100% irrefutable fraud, which I can't prove on a level of hundreds of thousands because I don't have the time, there is nothing that can be done and there is no interest in doing anything. This was on YouTube, this was removed. And you also then posted, I've been suspended from YouTube, I guess banned temporarily. They're making it clear that conservative opinions as it relates to COVID or the election are not welcome. And right. mysteriously, just within the last day, that was removed. No explanation yes. why. No, they did give me an explanation. And that, as a matter of fact, they haven't given any explanation as to exactly what we said that was incorrect with the uh, voter fraud or COVID video, just that it's dangerous. Um, but with that one, so I have a second channel. Crowder Bits is a channel. Where we just cut clips, you know, sometimes sketches go up there. And uh, that channel didn't have any strikes. So I just uploaded a cell phone video, basically me saying, hey, like you said, this has happened. They claimed it was a violation of their circumvention rules, but they've never been applied that way. The circumvention rules uh, have all the precedent set there is they ban a video from one channel. You can't just try and re-upload that same video to another channel. Circumvention rules have not been used to ban someone from saying, hey, just so you know, my video was removed. I won't be able to post on that channel for a while. So this is very unique. So they want to make sure that this information just doesn't get out there. And look, this isn't about me. I don't want, uh, you, you see all these stories where people talk about it all the time. This is different because they have a lawyer on retainer. And of course, we're going to take legal action. We always do. In the past, we've always won. The issue here is this is something that's going to have to escalate. It's going to take a long amount of time. We live in Biden's America right now, where again, you, if you are a conservative, if you are someone who expresses an opinion, even if accurate and they don't like, they will remove it. Investigative journalism is dead. The kind of work that you did, that I grew up with, which was really inspiring. When people ask about my show, they say, hey, what do you compare it to? Because a lot of conservatives don't really know entertainment content. They go, is it like a conservative daily show? I say, no. Well, first off, certainly not like the daily show today because our show is funny. But um, I always say it's actually, you. It, it's, like a middle, it's like a cross between David, early David Letterman, maybe Howard Stern TV and John Stossel. That's how I describe it to people. And they go, oh, 
yeah, that makes sense. The kind of stuff that you did with your give me a break segments and the hidden, uh, the investigative journalism, specifically when you investigated corruption in bureaucratic government would never be allowed on YouTube today. Don't say what I did. I'm still doing it once a week and most of it gets on. Okay, well then I stand corrected. I can remember some ones where you you uh, you led to some hot water for elected officials, and uh, I guess it just depends on who it is. But what you're still doing like government corruption, where you're doing hidden camera stuff? Yeah, in a way, I'm annoyed with you because I research <laughs> things and I interview the other side and investigate, and I'm reaching yeah. a lot of people, millions, and you're just shooting from the hip mostly, doing comedy, and you reach twice as many people. Well, I will tell you this, I would compare our re references and sources, and I guarantee you, um, we probably have about 10 times the amount you do because we reach billions. And I don't say that to be, I say that because I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to justify every joke that I make. But for example, that job of cross-referencing, that took several weeks of nonstop work um, for research that I am not nearly as capable at doing as you are. Listen, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, not like yourself. I never came up through through any sort of investigative journalism. I often just do this job because no one else is doing it. And yes, I have a general problem with authority. But no, if we go out there and I say, look, this person didn't live at this address. This person doesn't live in this new address. You can take it to the bank that this person doesn't live at that address. If I say COVID is significantly more lethal for old people and significantly less for young people, you can go to my website, check the source, and you can take it to the bank. I've never been wrong. I don't shoot from the hip on those. The one that got you in trouble recently is is your comments about $5 billion going to farmers of color. Most happy about the new policy, these people. I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna oh. buy a plow, man. <laughs> I'm gonna plant that corn. <laughs> Go get a John Deere, Barack Obama, mother. I'm the president of plowing that ad. Yeah, that was, that was a joke where we did an impression of people from, and again, keep in mind the context of that joke. The big difference, there's a big difference. People should be able to understand this. For example, when Trevor Noah goes out and says, the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes because of calling it the China virus and angry white people, that's a claim. That's not a joke. I differentiate between that claim and when he makes a joke. And even if I don't find it funny, I have to acknowledge that it's a joke. When me and my co-host Dave Landau are talking about uh, the irony in that white suburbans have moved or white rural people have moved into downtown Detroit to urban farm and we're supposed to believe that the inverse has happened. And again, we talked about the numbers of how many people in this country are black farmers proportionally to the number allotted to them. Then we go into an impression of hipsters in Detroit and uh, Detroit African Americans living out on farms. It's a fish out of water tale. And it's funny. But the way you and your co-host did it was mean, oh. nasty. I don't blame YouTube for saying, I don't want this on our channel. No, I thought you had a better sense of humor than that. <laughs> okay. And uh, I guess, this, I, and, and no, I say, look, I think that we, I think one thing and the reason people enjoy when you're on my show and I'm, uh, we, we interact is the ability to be frank. I think there's a reason that, uh, that John Stossel isn't writing any uh, comedy spec scripts anytime soon. And there's a reason that I've never wanted to be um, an investigative journalist. And sometimes things fall in my lap. For example, Antifa. This is a per I never wanted to infiltrate Antifa, right? I don't know if you know this. The FBI was on the phone with us because we infiltrated their encrypted app for a goof. All of a sudden, the officers are involved, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, because they handed my producer a knife, an ice pick, and they were going to get a sawed off shotgun from their trunk for a Ben Shapiro live show. Um, this stumbles in our lap because of our audience. I would love to do nothing but the entertaining uh, jokes that uh, many people find tasteless, um, but uh, I'm okay with it. No one, I don't expect everyone to like it. But not just taste, it's, it it's mean. Miss, Mr. Lispy Queer from Vox, the gay Vox sprites wrong. He could be a tranny, Your Honor. I don't even get the joke. It just feels nasty. Yeah. Well, first off, you're not quoting jokes. What am I quoting? You're, you're, you're quoting me referencing his own self-descriptions. Those aren't the jokes in that video. It's a 20-minute video. There are jokes, and then they're me saying, the, 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 the lispy queer from Vox, because he says, the lispy queer from Vox. 
right? So there are different things you can't take. In other words, David Letterman interviewing Donald Trump where uh, he attacks him and then take some jokes and misapply them to an interview where he's being serious. No, those weren't the jokes. People need to watch the 20 minute video. People need to watch the over 20 or 30 Vox rebuttals, many of which never involved this person. They are brutal, they are rough. I am unapologetic, especially in the face of the biggest corporations in the world who are trying to ensure that independent voices, yourself included, John, yourself included once the channel gets big enough that you are not able to have that voice. When my wars and legal battles go with NBC Universal, ABC Disney, Viacom, Turner CNN, and now they say to YouTube, well, we don't want them on the platform. Listen, don't have to like what I say, but uh, I think at the end of the day, you'll be glad that there's someone there, someone there doing it. And the algorithm they change to nail you for doing things like that now also deep platformed channels that simply covered sensitive issues like a history teacher's channel that showed Nazi footage to right. teach about World War II. Right. And I've, I've had stuff, oh, go ahead, what were you gonna say? No, I was just say, what's your, I don't understand, what's your point there? Yeah, I think it's horrible. I'm taking your side on this in that I've, done videos uh, with Camille Foster and Larry Elder. Racism has never been more insignificant a factor in one's success. And YouTube said the content might offend marginalized individuals or groups. My video on politicians who send kids to private schools but are against school choice, topics right. may be unsettling for our viewers. Right. Well, I think what's also important is, you know, for example, we go back to you saying that it's mean, where, again, keep in mind the Vox guy refers to I watched. As it seemed needlessly nasty. Yeah. Do you think anything is as needlessly nasty as referring to Donald Trump as Putin's cock holster, his mouth as his cock holster, or Melania Trump as a feckless cunt? That's the standard by which you got to judge me. And ours is a PG-13. But there's a difference between mocking the president, the overclass, and mocking minorities. Well, no, no, I wasn't mocking minorities. I was mocking NBC Universal, who, by the way, co-produce a show with YouTube and Vox. Talk about an incestuous relationship. YouTube financially co-produces a program with Vox, which is uh, you know, a subsidiary of NBC Universal. I've bankrolled this entire thing from $40,000 in my savings account back in 2009. So yeah, there is a bit of a David and Goliath story. And sometimes, you know what, you got to use a sling as opposed to a polished sword. But no, I think I think that you're buying something just from watching it out of context. The context would require you watching every rebuttal that we've done to Vox. And I guarantee you that would include thousands, just our rebuttals to Vox, thousands of references, most of which come from PubMed, most of which come from peer-reviewed scientific journals, certainly in COVID, coming from the CDC and World Health Organization. And today, we just forced one of my producers to eat a mushroom because he had a lifelong fear of it because someone lost their face due to a fungi similar to a mushroom. It's silly, and we do it, and uh, we're the only ones doing it on the right. And you know what, I, I, I really, I, the one thing is, I grew up wishing there was at least one alternative to far left entertainment. And I think when you look at what's permissible with Trevor Noah, what's permissible with everyone on these giant corporate um, networks at this point and what we do, it, it really is pretty tame. Humor is, uh, I think it was Phyllis Diller who said this, it's a rubber tipped sword. It's a way to make a point without drawing blood. And you know what really bothered me with comedians to kind of draw a parallel, Sarah Silverman, you know, um, and Amy Schumer, they were shock comics. I don't know if you ever followed Sarah Silverman, but her whole act was the bait and switch where it would be racist or it would be anti-Semitic. Like for example, one of her famous jokes was where she said, you know, I realized that a lot of, uh, you have these race, you have these redneck Christians who blame the Jews for killing Jesus. And I think that's ridiculous. I'm still one of the few people who blames the blacks. That was her joke. Pretty I don't funny think she joke. could tell that joke today. No, and she certainly couldn't tell the joke about how she watches starving children in Africa and wonders why are all these eight-year-olds pregnant? That was her joke. Rough. I think it's abhorrent. I think she has a right to do it. Now, I personally think that she was funny doing that, but now she has said, you can't describe something as gay. And so what Sarah Silverman has done is made her many, many, many millions once she's had her DreamWorks deals and her, her show at Comedy Central, and then she's pulled the ladder up and closed the door behind her. I don't wanna do that. I could do that. I want to see 
other people on these platforms coming up. I don't want to be the last one. Um, and I remember being really excited coming up uh, and thinking, well, you know what? If I work really hard here online, it doesn't matter what some executive says. It doesn't matter what some producer says. If people want to watch this, we can create it and we'll find our people. But now that's gone. Now there's more control than ever before. I mean, even at this point too, think about it. When we have to deal with the FCC, at least you knew what you were dealing with. You couldn't say anything scatological, certain bad words, right? But now you say something that isn't even offensive. And then someone with some small blog and a few people on Twitter amplify it and the person loses their job because people deem it offensive enough that day. I, I mean, dealing with the F FCC was a cakewalk when I was on radio compared to this. Now it's not about the FCC canceling you based on guidelines and rules that you actually know. It's people trying to remove your ability to make a living forever based on rules that don't exist. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that goes away, but it starts with some lawsuits and some states taking action. And, and Florida's done well, Texas looks like it's going to be next and we need a few more. That could really change the momentum. And you've succeeded with it. You're getting election time, 7 million views. That's just about equal to Fox. It is equal to CNN on YouTube. It was 16 million, actually. Oh, I read seven. Yeah, no, that's because our stream broke and then we had to restart it. But cumulatively, it was, yeah, 16 million. And listen, I think that's silly. But I think that shows what a failure. What a failure. CNN, ABC, NBC, uh, CBS and Fox News have done in serving their viewers. We covered it in real time. We were the first ones covering, you know, them uh, these uh, ballots coming in on, uh, what are those, uh, red flyer wagons in Detroit. While that was happening, you're saying, huh, that's, that's weird. And then the report's coming in at 4.30 in the morning saying, uh, in those coolers or camera equipment. I've traveled with a crew of 15 for years in my life. Never once have we put cameras in Coleman coolers. Are you in that habit, uh, John? I know you're familiar with camera equipment. You put them in Coleman coolers to no. take them to election precincts? No. So that's the only reason on election night we didn't get dinged for conspiracies because it was ha happening in real time and no one else had their answers at that point. Um, I don't think that we should be getting those kinds of numbers on an even playing field. I think that Fox News with their billions of dollars and profits should probably be able to put out a better product. But I think they called Arizona with, uh, with uh, a fraction of the vote in and we waited. One more criticism of the stuff I've watched from you. The Keep them coming, I deserve all of it. Okay, Cultural Appropriation Month. Love it. You're dressed like, I don't know what, you're, you're drowning a blonde doll in a glass of water. I don't even understand the joke. Yeah, that was an episode where we talked about, uh, so keep in mind too, I was in, uh, as a matter of fact, what's funny, this is a video that you reviewed for me when I was at Fox News when I went to the Cancun Climate Summit and you gave me really good feedback. You said, you know what? It's good, surprisingly good information. Talk less, show more. And I said, okay. And I actually, I followed that. I went down to the Cancun Climate Summit where I watched uh, Ted Turner advocate China's one child policy to improve climate change. Cultural Appropriation Month is in any given week. We appropriate a new culture because to appropriate is to appreciate. Now this comes from uh, on the heels with Taco Tuesday being banned um, at schools, for example, or sombrero themed parties. And then it grew from there. That episode was, uh, and there've been several where we've been talking about how the Green New Deal and specifically at the Cancun Climate Summits, the advocacy of China's one child policy, which by the way, has resulted in countless girls being drowned in a bathtub. And so we portray that in a way that is shocking, offensive, so people know what our elected officials are actually proposing legislatively. And if people are more offended by me pantomiming what happens in China every single day than politicians who actually would if they had their way, limit families to one child per household in order to appease Gaia, the green earth God, then that's just someone I disagree with. I don't think the joke is more offensive than the policy. Other people who've been demonetized include Ezra Levant's network. Yeah. Uh, the Epic Times, Carl Benjamin, Tommy Robinson, Paul Joseph Watson. Any comments? I think it's terrible. Well, this has been going on for a long time. Um, I don't listen. I can say I don't know all of the content on all of those channels, but um, what I can know is whether the rules are applied equally. 
I'm willing to bet the people you, you just mentioned Ezra Levant and the Epic Times. And I know, I know uh, uh, of what's the Sargon of Akkad, Carl Benjamin. I know he gets into edgy territory, but I can guarantee you that Ezra Levant and Epic Times, unless I'm wrong, probably haven't had someone blowing Satan and selling sneakers with vials of blood in them. That one's child friendly and still monetized. Oh, if they're going to claim to be a neutral platform, I don't know how you monetize one, make it kid friendly and put the other behind an age restriction. I don't need to know all the details. I just need to know the main ones. Is dick or dildo monetized and child friendly? Yes. Has Ezra Levant ever used a cuss word? No, he bleeps it. Okay, don't really care about the opinion at that point. It's just not a, it's just not a rule that's applicable. And right now, and this is something too, that, that all information right now, I think we both know this, all information is controlled by about five companies. About five companies. Apple, Amazon, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. It used to be, remember, you had three networks and people would say, well, we'll never get the numbers of Johnny Carson again, right? Because he would average, like he'd get like 50 million a night. And then you had this sort of, it was fracturing of media where you then had thousands of channels. We had 2020, which you watched as a kid, and we would get 15, 20 million people. Yes, because there were only three networks and there was a fracturing and they had all of these other networks, like thousands, right, of channels. Um, and people said, well, you never get those numbers again. And now we've gone back to that in a way uh, where it's really five companies. And when you're talking about consuming media with people under the age of 35, Netflix, Amazon, YouTube. And then there are some peripheral players like HBO Max or maybe Hulu, um, but certainly fewer than hundreds. You, you'd be able to count them on one hand, uh, maybe two if you're, you know, like a royal, uh, one of the royal children, depending how far down the lineage you go. But more than we used to have, people do have more choice. No, no, but as far, but people aren't subscribed to, when you look at the unpluggers. So what I'm saying is the numbers went from 50 million with Johnny Carson to the point where, you know, let's use Fox News as an example. Fox News was the number one leader in all of cable, right? It's not just cable news, all of cable many nights. And that was getting 3 million views in prime time, right? That pales in comparison, like Cobra Kai just averaged 36 million viewers. So Breaking Bad, their season finale was, I believe, 12 to 13 million. And that was considered the last big hurrah. And my point is now it's more concentrated again. And then specifically as it relates not just to media consumption, but human interaction, social media. And YouTube is sort of on, you know, has one foot in both camps there where it's kind of social media. It's not really Netflix, but people are using it to watch a lot of content. And uh, we have a few companies. We have Amazon, right? We have Apple. Uh, who are getting into more of the consumable media uh, sphere now as, op as opposed to uh, consumable goods. Then you have Google, Alphabet Network, owns YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and you can add Netflix, Amazon, call it Hulu. That covers about 90% of what anyone under the age of 35 is watching now. They're not plugged into cable. And these people have gotten together to consolidate power in many ways. Look, I don't think it requires a conspiracy theorist to say, hey, whether it's Alex Jones or um, there have been several examples, someone got deplatformed from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and their book removed from the Amazon store in the same day, and they didn't even upload the same content to all those platforms. That's where you have to say, okay, there are some conversations that are being had, and this is scary. We do have alternatives now, like Odyssey and Parler. If people don't like YouTube, they have a choice of being able to switch. Right. And I know some people would, would, would say that. Um, and, I, and by the way, I think some of these companies are really putting in a valiant effort. And I've been in talks with some of these companies um, behind the scenes. Here's the issue. A couple of things. First off, they have a fraction. And I mean a fraction of the user base of YouTube. They also have a fraction of the budget to give to politicians and to give to law and you know, have lobbyists going there. So they don't have that ability. Not only that, they don't have the ability to pay creators. And so effectively there is a monopoly because YouTube, every time there's been a competitor, whether it's, um, I don't know who bought TikTok and Snapchat versus who bought Vine, but every time there's some kind of a competitor, it is bought up immediately. And then these three sites are the only sites that are able to actually provide a living uh, to people for creating content, right? And they've said, this is the thing, is they've advertised to these people, hey, put your content on Facebook, put your content on YouTube, 
And we're going to make sure that you can make a living. You get to keep the fans who you generate. And I say this because they've called me directly, Facebook and YouTube, where they've asked me to advertise with them. I'm pro-business. I'm anti-fraud. So there really is no way for uh, places like these sites to compete um, as far as new people building up audiences. It's just not possible. For example, you know, I started in my den. It was radio. I mean, this was after I was at Fox News for about four years and then did my own show uh, that was syndicated on radio. I podcasted it, streamed it in my den, then moved to my garage studio, moved where we are now from one employee to three to six, now to 15. That wouldn't be possible on Parler. It wouldn't be possible on Odyssey. And there's another problem too. Um, for me, as far as, as far as sort of, I guess, uh, my purpose, for lack of a better word, uh, I don't want to just be preaching to the choir. That's also why YouTube deems me a threat. I mean, when we have, yeah, sure, you, you mentioned some of the offensive jokes, but we have, we have, you know, nine hours of content, I think, every week. We do Ash Wednesday, which is effectively where we bring in uh, pastors or priests. We have Convert Crowder Week, where it could be a Catholic, it could be a Mormon, and we just talk about different religious theology. Um, we have long form interviews. We've done them with you. We've done them with scientists. Uh, today, we just piece that uh, we just parsed through the mask mandates in Texas and Mississippi and what the infection rates have been since March 3rd and March 10th and what the death rates have been. We do this. And of course, what gets the headline is the joke that people don't like, but that's really not the bulk of what we do. And we've probably bought, uh, brought, and I know as an atheist, you won't like this, uh, probably brought more uh, 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 millennial atheists into the church than any other program because we're not preachy and because we're not proselytizing. I'm a Christian, I make no apology about it, um, but this isn't a Christian show. And that's sort of a gap that hasn't been bridged for a long time. And so it's important for me to reach the unreached, whether it's saying, hey, you know what? Nuclear energy is actually cleaner than a lot of form of renewables, or me saying, hey, you know what? When you move fundamental Judeo-Christian values from any culture, it creates a vacuum that's going to be filled. And you're seeing that in Europe with Islam. Um, it's important for me to reach those unreached. And so what I've done is safeguard myself as much as I can on these open platforms, really the tripopoly, right? YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, um, and then created you know, the Mug Club, which is where people can pay. Uh, and I'll give myself a plug here if that's okay, uh, lottocredit.com slash mug club where they can join and we provide them with additional content. So um, they get value added. They get to talk with us directly. They get an additional 45 minutes of content every day. And they also understand that their independent support and fundraising is what allows us to create the free content that uh, reaches new people. I mean, for crying out loud, John, you know, people, this happens too, where people will bring up jokes out of context. Um, if, a cons if the guy who does change my mind, which is literally everything that you and I were taught in media couldn't possibly work. And I know this because I pitched it at Fox News and was told it was crap. And I pitched the book idea and I was told it was crap. The idea was this, look, the problem that we have in media is we put people in a quadrant view and we give them a limited amount of time and they're all trying to score points so they can go back to either renew their contributorship or represent their think tank or magazine and get more spots. I said, but I've never had a good conversation on air. I've never had the kind of conversation on air that I have at the gym or I have at the coffee shop. So what if we did this segment, we just release it online where we set up a table with, a, with an opinion that might be deemed controversial and we edit nothing. We take nothing out of context. Whatever happens, we film. Everyone said it wouldn't work. And we do that and it works. And when people talk about the stuff they don't like, they never talk about I'm pro-life, change my mind in a three hour video. They never talk about me saying I'm pro second amendment, change my mind. And not only talking with kids on college campuses after a mass shooting, but taking girls to a gun range who had never fired a weapon. And then they wanted to purchase a firearm only to realize that they couldn't because of the background check, which they couldn't meet because they weren't 21. The education that takes place on a show just be, is, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of hours with Change My Mind. No one else has done it because it's not headline worthy. And that tells us that we really do live in a society that's craving that, that's craving some authenticity. Look, when you're not editing it, I can't edit that to make myself look good. There is no way to do it.
There is no way to do it. You've been on this show. Uh, we did Devil's Advocate, right? What is that? That's a show where I tell everybody on this show, and you know, I said, you're not going to talk with Stephen Crowder. It's going to be Skylar Churden. You're never going to talk with Stephen Crowder. And I've done, and I do nothing but spend days in research looking for the liberal arguments that I deem are most effective and then try and find the most authoritative sources, people I admire. There were people like you, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson. Um, and I argue with them on a given topic. I don't remember what it was that we debated. Uh, welfare, it, perhaps? It might I have been forget. the welfare state. Does it ever become lonely being so unpopular in your viewpoints? Yes, often. And I remember you saying that was tougher than you thought because it wasn't me just going, Duh, I'm a liberal, I'm stupid. I sat down and I read Chomsky and I looked at, uh, and I went and sat in in classes with local professors who I knew were notoriously liberal. And I read every single mainstream leftist website that I could because the purpose to that is if people watch John Stossel capably handle um, this liberal caricature on my show, it will actually arm them with information and the line of critical thinking to convince people in their day-to-day -day life. I don't want to, to uh, knock down straw man. I have no interest in it because it doesn't serve the audience in the way uh, which my, my, my content is framed around. So I just say that because you know that is me not defending myself, but I think a lot of people will take something that's most offensive because the truth is the vast majority of what we do is so boring that mainstream traditional media said this will never work. People will never stay tuned for devil's advocate. What you're gonna do when you're gonna do an hour debating John Stossel on the welfare state? Well, you're gonna do an hour with Ben Shapiro. You're gonna what as a liberal actually argue with Jordan Peterson on identity politics? What changed my mind? You're gonna do you're gonna do two hours on uh, existentialist Simone de Beauvoir and Judith Butler and John Money and go through modern gender three. No one's gonna watch that. Well, they're right. Here's the thing: no one in the media watches it they pull a clip out of context and say, look at this offensive joke Stephen made. But then 10 million people do sit for hours to say, yeah, but look at the minds they've changed and look at the conversations they have that aren't taking place anywhere else. So I don't, ap I don't apologize for jokes that people don't like for the same reason I don't apologize for change my mind, which every network executive told me would be an abysmal failure. At a certain point, you have to trust what you believe in. All right, before we go, I wanna know about the 2020 piece you still remember yes. but couldn't find. Yes even though I'm so sad to hear that I've disappointed you today, but I'm still your biggest fan. So what it was, was you were doing a, a piece on uh, Native American uh, uh, reservations and specifically how I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, how if the idea of sort of uh, 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 socialism, which wasn't the term that you used really worked, that these places should have done well because a lot of these people would have government checks and didn't necessarily have to work. I remember there were quite a few people in Canada who were outraged and I didn't think you did anything outrageous. I thought it was hilarious. The theme of this story was that no group has been more helped by government than yes. the Indians and no group has done worse. You just said Indians. See, that's something that could, I could, I've gotten in trouble. I've gotten warnings for saying Indians on YouTube videos. Well, I started saying Native Americans and Indians told me, well, we're not Americans. We're not from India. So you're right. I think natives is the better word. Well, now it's First Nations. So you got that wrong. <laughs> Okay. So that's my point. Lisp be queer. This is my point. This matters. When someone has in their label queer with a lisp, and then they go, no, now that's a pejorative. Do you know what else was told to me from YouTube was a pejorative? What? Hand to God, I have this in an email. Mexican. Well, they said, yes, but you said that. You said this they said, you said this Mexican gay guy. People's what would we say? What would, what would I say? I don't know. So that was actually, so that's why I say at a certain point, you create, you, this monster gets created when you say, well, you're saying I can't say, well, you can't say that. Well, yeah, but you said I can't say Mexican. So whatever at this point, you know, that's what ends up happening. Now on the flip side, that's also why I'm afraid that in the United States of America, you're going to have, you're going to have a post-racial generation, which was me, where we grew up in our, our the number one shows on television vision where Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and uh, Family Matters and hip hop were the biggest selling albums, right? It was, we didn't really think about race and I had a lot of black friends growing up in Canada. Um, and then even when I moved to the United States, but now when you have um, black liberation theology and we have critical race theory being taught in schools and kids being lined up and told to apologize for being white, the effect that's happened with me in comedy where I'm going, I don't really care about 
decorum anymore at all because you said Mexican was offensive. I'm worried you're going to have with young kids and the idea of racism. They're going to say, I don't really care if you say I'm racist anymore because you told me to apologize for being white. And that pendulum swings the other way. That does concern me. And I think it's something that we're going to see happening. Back to the 2020 thing though. So this, this was a great piece that you did and it opened my eyes a lot. I didn't know this about, I didn't know much about Native American reservations outside of uh, the fact that the UFC events were taking place uh, on them at the time. And I remember you telling this person uh, uh, who might've been a, uh, whatever the term is, chieftain, I don't know what's offensive or not offensive, saying, uh, but you know, you've, be you've benefited, you seem to be doing well here at the, uh, here in your house, you have running water, electricity, a television. And he said, yes, but that's only because the white man forces me to live this way. And you paused and you said, but you're wearing jeans. And I don't remember, I don't know why that just stuck with me as so blunt and a visceral reaction that him and his wranglers, as though that was forced upon him through some other uh, cultural imperial imperialists. I might've been eight at the time when I saw it. And I remember cocking my head back and laughing. And I asked my dad if he had a book. And then I bought, bought that book. And then I bought your next, I think at that time, the only book was your autobiography. And then your next book was Myths, Lies and Downright Stupidity. Get the Shovel, Why Everything You Know Is Wrong. Long title, but I think I have that right. Good memory, exactly. And Give Me a Break was the first one. Well, I'm, uh, depending on which things of yours I watch, I'm either honored or horrified that I influenced eight-year-old you. Well, um, I guess that's the greatest compliment I could ever receive, because I think that you've had that effect on a lot of people as well. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Crowder.